So I wanted to thank Rena, the Institute for Medical Education, of course, um, the Department of Family Medicine, and everyone for being here. And very importantly, I wanted to thank the students. Are there any students in here today? Maybe not. That's okay. Um, and also importantly, my patients, because without the students and the patients, none of us would be doing the fun and, in my opinion, important good work uh, that we're all doing. So thanks again for the opportunity. Um, and today I'm going to be speaking about the Primary Care Scholars Program. Um, I have nothing to disclose today. And the objectives for today's talk are to appreciate the demand for increased primary care physicians, particularly underserved communities, which is what I think sort of makes this program special because that's one of its main goals, right? Um, I want to also describe the importance of, the, of a longitudinal, multidisciplinary, team-based approach to primary care medical education because I think, as we all know, primary care is changing, health systems are changing, and I think with that, we need to think about the ways that primary care medical education also needs to change. Uh, I also hope uh, for us all to be able to identify opportunities for teaching quality improvement, research, and advocacy through partnerships with community-based organizations. That is one of the big things that we do um, with the PCSP, with the Primary Care Scholars Program. And for folks who are thinking about um, ways to incorporate uh, scholarship into their work as medical educators, um, I hope this presentation can provide some examples of how you can do that. Um, and so a little bit of background before getting into the details about the program specifically. You know, as we know, the projected need for primary care physicians in the United States is, is growing. Um, so this is just one study of many that were done. This is from uh, Annals of Internal Medicine in 2012. And they said that the three factors really um, driving the need for more primary care physicians are population growth, of course, the aging population, um, and health insurance expansion. And so this study estimated that from 2008 to 2025, the number of estimated primary care visits would increase from 462 million in 08 to 565 million. Um, and to sort of meet that need, the United States would require 52,000 additional primary care physicians. Um, this is uh, just a, a graphic using 2010 census data that shows um, that by 2050, the estimated number of people who are age 85 and older to sort of show the growing and aging population will reach 88.5 million and um, about 19 million folks will be aged 85 and older. Um, and so obviously the need for primary care physicians um, becomes quite evident. And this is just another slide. Um, this is actually looking at data from the AAMC in 2018. The top line shows sort of the best case, or I'm sorry, the, the worst case scenario, pairing the highest demand for primary care with the least supply of primary care physicians. The bottom line in the green shows the best case scenario, which actually shows an excess of 25,000 primary care physicians, which I don't think anyone realistically is thinking is going to be the situation that we face in 2030. Um, but a more realistic view looks is sort of at the middle two lines there. This represents the 75th percentile and the 25th percentile. And so those numbers kind of match the numbers from the prior study of um, a shortfall of around 52,000 primary care physicians um, by the middle of the century. Um, and of course, this disparity is not going to be equally shouldered across the country. Certain regions are predicted to have far less supply than demand of primary care physicians. And in all the dark blue areas, those are the areas where the demand will be greater than the supply. Anyone know what state this is? <laughs> it's Colorado, good. <laughs> Just checking. Um, so why do we think this is, right? I think it comes as no surprise that student debt is a major factor in why so many students are choosing not to pursue primary care. Um, this has been borne out in a lot of studies, which I'm going to sort of go through briefly. But in the past five years alone, you can see both the mean and median uh, amounts of student debt have increased by $20,000 in just the past five years, which is incredible. right? And not only that, if you look at the bottom three rows, it shows, especially looking at the bottom row, that as the years progress, students are not only taking out more loans, but the loans that they're, the amount of loans they're taking out are, are higher, right? And so um, in 2018, this is using uh, the AAMC, Medical Student Debt Cost Loan Repayment Fact Hoards. 16% of students took out over $300,000 in student debt, which is incredible. 
Um, not only that, it's just sort of looking at it in terms of percent increases, these are the percent increases over the same five years. But not only that, the number of students who are expected to participate in a loan repayment or forgiveness program has also increased, right? To sort of meet um, these figures, which are incredible. Um, and so then when you think about why aren't more students going to primary care, well, this is um, just data from the annual Medscape Physician Compensation Report from last year. But on average, primary care physicians, according to this one study at least, were making over $100,000 less than their specialist colleagues, right? And so when you put together the decreased earning potential along with the high burden of student debt, it sort of comes as no surprise that we're not meeting the sort of um, number needs we have, we need to meet the shortfall of primary care physicians. Um, this is a study from academic medicine. It's a little bit older from 2005, but they basically looked at the impact of medical students' debt on their choice of primary care careers. They found that the decision making around which career students choose is very complex, but they did see that students with higher debt were less likely to, than their counterparts to pursue careers in primary care, though the effect was modest. But then subsequently other studies have been done. This study looked specifically at um, students who trained at public institutions versus private institutions. And they also found that high educational debt deters graduates, uh, mostly of the public medical schools, interestingly, from choosing primary care. But that effect didn't bear out as much when looking at um, students who graduated from private schools. Sort of interesting. This is a more recent study as well from Annals of Family Medicine in 2014. If you look at racial and ethnic disparities in the amount of student debt that students are taking out, this, interestingly, I don't know if anyone follows politics, but this is Dr. Abdul M. Mel Sayed, who ran for governor in, um, in Michigan. Um, but this is a study that he had done with some colleagues over um, at Columbia um, that basically showed that African-American black students had significantly higher antip anticipated debt than Asian and Asian-American students. And the percentages here, if you're interested, are 77.3% of African-American students had debt in excess of 150,000, as compared to 65.1% of uh, what they call white, 57.2% uh, Hispanic, and 50.2% of Asian or Asian-American students. So the amount of debt that folks are taking out um, is also different, right? Um, so who is matching into primary care with this amount of debt, with the, the lower expected income? Um, this one study from last year in the Journal of Healthcare for the Poor and Underserved showed that racial and ethnic minority physicians, despite having more debt, are more likely to practice primary care and serve in underserved communities. But this is just one study. When you're looking, uh, this is also from the Medscape Physician Compensation Report. When you're looking at all of the folks who matched in 2018, fourth year medical students, and this is just US graduates, um, about 14% matched into family medicine, which is pretty typical. For, uh, for family medicine every year. Internal medicine categorical, um, there were 12% of the uh, applicants matched into that. Um, for internal medicine primary care programs, so Sinai has a internal medicine primary care program, um, not all institutions have that. Um, about 1% of the slots went to students going into primary care internal medicine. And then for pediatrics, about 11% of students went into. And this is pretty typical. Um, so in total, about 37, 38% of medical students are choosing to go into primary care, which is not a lot. Um, we also know, according to the, the match data from last year, that more and more positions are being offered in family medicine, internal medicine, and in pediatrics than in subsequent years. And in each of these, so in family medicine, offerings have increased since 2008, and this year 3,629 positions were offered. Um, in internal medicine, the same. Um, the numbers of positions being offered have increased as well for over a decade now. Um, and in pediatrics, about the same. And so the number of physicians offered this year is actually a record high, which I thought was interesting. Interestingly, I should mention that of these spots, um, 47 or 48 percent of those spots are being filled by international graduates. So about half are of these spots that I just mentioned that are going to categorical family medicine, internal medicine, and pediatrics are being filled by international graduates. So other factors um, that I think might be contributing to the lack of folks entering or choosing careers in primary care, I think, I mean, just speaking from my own experience, when you look at traditional clerkships for primary care, they're six or they're eight weeks. And, you know, in my opinion, I don't think those clerkships 
give students an opportunity to really experience primary care in the way that it exists in the world where you know you make an intervention you change a medication and a few weeks to a few months later you you assess the impact of that intervention that you made right that the clerkships don't reflect the longitudinal nature of what it is that primary care physicians do right and so i think that plays a huge role in sort of students understanding of what primary care is and what you can do in primary care um, and through that traditional six or eight week clerkship experience i think students often lack the opportunity to develop continuity relationships with their preceptor or with patients um, with the staff that they're working with so intensely throughout the course of that clerkship. Um, and then I think other times, depending on the systems that the students are working in, if they're working in an, you know, a disorganized system where maybe a primary care physician consulted a specialist and that PCP never got the specialist's report back and they have no idea what's happened to the care of their patient and um, the care is disjointed in that way, I think that could be a turnoff right, to students who maybe feel like they want to do good work, they want to have, uh, provide high quality coordinated care, safe patient care, and when they don't see that in practice, I think that could also be um, a deterring factor to students choosing careers in primary care. Now this isn't sort of borne out in evidence, but these are just sort of some things that I've experienced in talking with students and also just in my own experience reflecting personally. And I think the traditional clerkship experience focuses a lot on providing students with an opportunity to learn their history and physical exam, maybe by the end of the clerkship, depending on when it is in third year, developing an assessment, presenting it. And I think often their students lack an opportunity to sort of work on the skill sets that I think we all see as being really critical to the primary care physician sort of of today and of the future, right? And so that's, those are the skills of sort of thinking about um, quality improvement, how to incorporate thoughts around patient safety within the clinical encounter, within the way that you interact with your staff, within the way that you interact with your electronic medical record. I don't think they often get an opportunity to think about outcomes and how you manage those, how you manage an in-basket, how you manage um, patient portal messages to, um, to a primary care physician. What do you do when you get 20 in a day? How to manage populations over time how to look at quality metrics and make interventions to make sure that your patients are getting the high quality care that they know is going to increase their lives. Looking at performance measurements as well. So I don't think that traditional clerkships provide so many of those opportunities in the six to eight weeks that they're allotted. And so a lot of these skills that I think are necessary for PCPs of the future, particularly high capacity to adapt to and manage change as primary care changes, as health records change, um, as well as the communication and diagnostic reasoning skills and leadership skills to really meet, lead that team-based model. Um, I don't think they're getting that opportunity, but I think these things are really important for training um, primary care physicians of the future. And also importantly, the bottom line is stewardship to manage appropriate use of resources, right? Um, because there are so many patients who have so many needs, but you know, what if you don't have access to a specialist? Or what if you are working in a resource-limited area? Um, how do you decide and how do you teach that? And so that's where this program comes in and sort of um, with the help of the Department of Medical Education, Family Medicine, and so many other folks at Sinai, I think for years now we had sort of put a lot of our thoughts around all of this together to develop the curriculum for the Primary Care Scholars Program, um, which I think a lot of folks in this room know, but is a longitudinal four-year program here at um, Mount Sinai for students who come into medical school knowing that they want to do primary care. And so a lot of the students have a ton of experience working either as care navigators, maybe in public health. Um, others have had careers totally separate from medicine. One is, I think, a pastor. Um, our students range in age from just out of medical school, I'm um, sorry, from undergraduate to I think our oldest student is 40 and have an incredibly diverse range of interests. And so the idea behind the program really was to provide students an opportunity to bring in some of the skills that they've honed in their other careers and their interests and their passions um, and to sort of bring that new energy and that thought and that innovation to, um, to primary care. And I'll go through the mission of the program, um, which is to attract medical students from diverse backgrounds, like I had mentioned, to becoming leaders in primary care, particularly for underserved communities. So that's a core tenet of what it is we want to do. We don't just want to produce primary care physicians, but we want to produce PCPs that are going to go out in the world and work in areas where uh, PCPs are really needed. Um, this is a picture of our first class. And so, 
These are our students. They are fantastic. Um, so there are inaugural class, class from 2015. So they are fourth years now. Shirelli did take, take a scholarly year. Um, so she's in her third year now. Um, but Deepa, Emma, Shirelli, Ali, and Zach are from our first class. This is a combination of our second and third year classes. Um, and this is our first year class. Another part of our mission is to provide students, like I mentioned, with a, not just the clinical exposure, but also the advocacy training, research, and quality improvement opportunities to promote innovation and change in primary care. And this all happens sort of at Sinai, but also importantly, um, with the Institute for Family Health. The clinical site where the students do their clinical care is at the Family Health Center of Harlem, which if you haven't been, you're, you're more than welcome to have you there. It's an, on 119th Street and Madison Avenue. It's five stories. We have medical, mental health, dental. Um, it's a federally qualified health center. We see patients regardless of their ability to pay. We're open 365 days a year till 8 p.m. on weekdays, 5 p.m., 6 p.m. on the weekends, um, and there's always folks around. We also partner with a pharmacy across the street to get patients um, very reduced low-cost prescriptions for maybe one or two dollars a month if they are uninsured. So speaking of sort of the exposure to advocacy training, research, and QI opportunities, this is a picture of, um, I love this picture, I'll tell you why. This is a picture of so many people from the Institute and from Sinai from so many different levels. So we have medical students, dental students, we have two mental health clinicians, we have a certified diabetes educator in that picture, we have a resident physician who's now a fellow, we have a patient service representative, we have Gustavo Rivera who is a New York State Senator um, up in Albany and we have Barack Obama <laughs> in this photo and this is the day when we took our PCSP students and really any of the students that wanted to come to Albany for a lobby day. Lobby day. So every year the Community Health Center Advocacy Network of New York, Chicanies, um, is thrilled to have medical students come. So they um, host these students, they give them training on how to lobby. There's like a, before this day there's um, an intensive on how to write resolutions, how to actually speak to a lobbyist, how to get someone's attention. <laughs> and so for the students who were able to participate in that, I mean, I think that it was incredible training, right? And so they gave them talking points and they gave them the studies behind sort of why we want to increase funding to FQHCs and con continue the commitment to them. Um, and so that happens every year and every year we take students. Um, and so I love that picture for those reasons. And the idea is really to build that learning community, right? To, to teach the students from day one of medical school that the site certified diabetes educator to the uh, mental health clinician to the attending physician, of course, all of these people can teach you. Um, the one sort of person who's not in this is a patient, but many of our employees utilize our health centers. So if you want to consider them a patient, then yes, certainly. Um, and certainly the students can be taught by the patients as well. I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, but the idea is to build that community, right? Of students, faculty, other members of the healthcare team to nurture and support students' interests in pursuing primary care. We want them to leave medical school as excited about doing primary care as they were when they came in. And this is another picture. This is actually State Assembly person Latoya Joyner from the 77th District in the Bronx with the same group of folks. There's another, there's there are a couple more residents there and a couple more students there as well. Um, and so again, this is Albany Lobby Day. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. This is just sort of the timeline of how we developed the Primary Care Scholars Program. I think conversations actually started well before spring of 2014, but when I became involved, um, the Department of Medical Education, along with um, Family Medicine and the Department of Admissions, and of course, um, Med Ed and Administration came together and sort of developed and planned for the students the first students to come in the summer of 2015. Um, and so we admitted six students. Um, we developed curriculum in that first year around patient-centered chronic disease management, and I'll get into that curriculum a little bit more in a minute. And we also developed these quarterly sessions, which I'm gonna talk about in, in a little bit more as well. In 2016 and 17, we developed the curriculum for the next year. The second set of students matriculated. In 2017, the third set of students matriculated. And then, very excitingly, I thought, in 2017 and 2018, the first set of primary care students became third-year medical students, and they participated in the Interact program. So just by a show of hands, how many people are already aware of what Interact is? Okay, so most people. <laughs> um, and so, as you know, Interact is, it stands for the Interclerkship Longitudinal, Longitudinal Care Tract. Sorry, I say that three times fast. Um, but it's a clerkship interspersed over 13 to 14 weeks throughout the third year of medical school um, 
where a select group of medical students work with um, surgeons, um, you know, internal medicine, family medicine. The outpatient section of their clerkships is pulled out and occurs longitudinally over the course of the year, and it's a great opportunity to, um, to sort of practice longitudinal primary care. And in the spring of this year, actually, our first set of students will match, right? And so we're really excited to see um, which specialties they end up choosing. For the Primary Care Scholars Program, the way that we've defined primary care was a bit broader than how many programs define primary care. Um, we call primary care family medicine, internal medicine, pediatrics, even obstetrics. So if you're practicing primary care obstetrics, say in an outpatient clinic, doing prenatal care, doing intrapartum care, and then caring for that um, woman postpartum, and then in continuity that for us counts as primary care. We also count um, psychiatry as primary care. So if you were to practice psychiatry in um, a federally qualified health center um, in East Harlem or wherever, that also would, would, would count as primary care. Certainly select fellowships within each of those disciplines would not count. Um, and if anyone is interested, I could give you information on which fellowships do and do not sort of qualify for primary care. And I did not mention that um, one great part of the Primary Care Scholars Program, and I think a part of it that we are fortunate to have is because of the high amount of student debt that you know medical students, school graduates are facing, the PCSP offers $80,000 in loan forgiveness to students who practice primary care in underserved communities for two years after um, residency or fellowship training. And so that, it, that loan repayment will take the form of a low interest Mount Sinai loan that's repaid after those two years. And it's about $20,000 for each year of medical school. And so we also, so that's what Rena was saying when she, uh, it was mentioned like counts towards. Because if you choose any of the fellowships within each of those um, disciplines, all of that counts. You can do a fellowship. That's a question we get a lot. Um, do you just have to do straight up primary care? No. And intentionally, the criteria we use around loan repayment matches those of the NHSC. So if you wanted to participate in the National Health Service Corps loan repayment program, or if you're a National Health Services Corps scholar, that can be added to this. And that would significantly offset the amount of debt you have because we want students to be happy, you know, and not be shouldered by $300,000 of debt um, that they carry for 10, 15, 20 years beyond graduation from medical school. Um, and you want them to confidently choose their careers and also stay in, in those careers. So part of the student's curriculum and exposure is working with depression care managers who work in very close proximity. We work literally in the same room um, as, um, as the primary care physician. So we work as a team to address the sort of primary care as well as mental health needs of folks living with depression. Many students applied. Um, and so um, of students who are accepted into Mount Sinai, they were offered a secondary application to apply for the primary care scholars program. And I think in that first year, I think we got like in the 30s, if I recall. Yeah, for those six spots. Um, and so this is a picture of some of our current second year medical students and first year medical students. Um, this is at the roof of the Family Health Center of Harlem. Like I mentioned, it's very nice there. If you want to come, I'm happy to show you around. And so what do the students do in the first year? Um, about every month, about 10 times per year, the students come to the Institute for Family Health, Family Health Center of Harlem, and they work with a mentor who they're gonna work with for all four years of medical school, shadowing and working really closely alongside them at the Family Health Center. Um, and during those sessions, they're seeing patients, they're practicing their history and physical exam. We really try to pair what they're learning in LCE and ASM with what's happening here at the Family Health Center of Harlem. And then about every three to four months, we have what we call a quarterly community site problem-based session. Um, which I'll talk a little bit more about. And over the course of their first and second year, they're also playing and developing their scholarly projects, which for these students have to be within primary care, as broadly defined. Um, and so during these sessions, the students are working with medical assistants, nursing staff. They're learning how to take a blood pressure. So we're saying, all right, Moa Jones, like, sit this one out. <laughs> Student so-so is going to call the patient, do the vitals just for this one patient. They're working with nursing staff if they want to get hands-on and do um, any sort of nursing responsibilities. Importantly, they're working with case managers, social work. If a patient comes in who's uninsured and needs one of those 340B cards, I'll say, okay, student X, skip out on this next session and literally walk that patient downstairs to case management and see what that process is like that they have to go through. What documents do they have to show 
to prove that they're uninsured so that they would qualify for the 340B program. And by the way, if you want to walk them across the street <laughs> to take them to the pharmacy and see what that experience is like to get that prescription for $2 for the month and then come back. Or if a student is working with a patient who is diabetic and they walk in with sugar higher than can be read by the monitor. I'll have that student walk the patient up to the certified diabetes, diabetes educator or the CDE will come down and they'll talk with them about insulin. They'll do hands-on training on how to use an insulin injection for the first time. And so all of the resources sort of at the clinic are at the student's disposal. If a patient comes in with a positive PHQ2 and they need to be seen by a depression care manager that day because the PCP can't do a more thorough um, assessment of the mental health situation going on, they can go to see the depression care manager with that, with that patient. All of the resources at the FQHC are available to the student. If a patient comes in with a new diagnosis for HIV, we can have the patient work, or the patient and the student work with the COMPASS team, which is our comprehensive care management program for people living with HIV. Name the condition, we probably have someone who's doing case management or social work or mental health around that condition. We also have group classes I'd mentioned, or we'd mentioned that there are centering prenatal groups. Students are welcome to come to that. If a patient is newly diagnosed as pregnant and that patient wants to get put on that patient's panel, or that student wants to put that patient on their panel, they can follow that patient throughout the course of the pregnancy. And our preceptors really try to be intentional about scheduling follow up points or the days that the students are there. So it takes a lot of organization. Um, we need to know when the students are gonna be there in advance so that we can schedule follow up patient visits for the days the students are there. Um, and so really, like I said, everything at the disposal of the students or everything in the health center is at the disposal of the students to learn from. And so I think that's really, really, really unique. Um, and then every three to four months, like I mentioned, we have these sessions where we get together. And in the first year, we talk about patient-centered chronic disease management. And so um, each of these quarterly visits are an opportunity to sort of take a break from the clinical grind and to just sit and be together as a whole cohort the mentors are there, the faculty mentors are there, the students are there, and they're broken down into three parts. One, a patient comes, an, an actual IFH patient comes and talks to the students about what their experience is living with disease. Um, and so I really want the students to sort of ground their understanding of what it's like to live with the condition and what the struggles are living with that condition, accessing healthcare for that condition from that patient's perspective. And now patients have been doing this for four years and they're really well versed in talking about you know their experiences. The second part of these cohort sessions are when we actually go out to a site in the community where clinicians are practicing caring for that condition. And then the third part is we go to either a community-based organization or we speak with a social worker or a non-clinician advocate who's really working sort of on the institutional structural level to address policy changes around that issue so that we can help sort of give the students an idea of what upstream factors need to get addressed and sort of what the priorities are of you know, organizations doing this kind of work day in and day out with the community. Does that make sense? And so it's thinking about things sort of individually, institutionally, and then again, broadly, structurally, and giving the students that understanding and opportunity to learn about diseases and conditions from all three of those levels. Um, and just as one example, the first problem-based session we do is with around asthma. And so um, every year we have a patient who is actually a patient of mine who was almost left back because she had so many absences from school because of poorly controlled asthma because of you know poor conditions within the home environmental factors impacting their asthma and so that student and her mother actually who's fantastic talk about the ways that they advocated for themselves to, to not make that happen and to really sort of fix the upstream factors that were affecting that child's asthma and so for the community session, we go out to PS57, where the Institute for Family Health has a school-based health center, and we talk with the clinician there whose job, like all winter, is to care for kids with asthma, right? Um, and so it's an opportunity for the students to see that as a primary care physician, this is an area where you could work, this is an area where you could make good impacts and sort of allow students to be able to receive care without having to choose between care and school. Um, and then finally, for the sort of advocacy component of the afternoon, we go to the um, Department of Health's um, East Harlem Asthma Center for Excellence. And Dr. Trey Dixon, who's there, has been speaking to the students for a few years now, as well as um, so many other staff members who talk about the advocacy work they've been doing to address health disparities around asthma in East Harlem. And this is just sort of a map. Like, they start here at Sinai, they walk up to the Institute, we go to PS57, we go to the East Harlem Asthma Center for Excellence. And then if there's time, we usually will get coffee at a coffee shop and give the students a chance to sort of just decompress 
and talk about you know what it was that they experienced, what questions they have remaining. Sometimes the students were like, oh my gosh, what did I just learn? Like, being a clinician is not enough. Like, we are not going to fix these problems by prescribing albuterol all day. Um, and sort of in those sessions, I think a lot of the students' passions come out. And then I think they also feel like they're doing something that is addressing some of the deeper and, you know, more ingrained problems, systemic problems that make them feel not like just a cog in the wheel. Um, and so we have similar sessions for heart failure, for diabetes, and these are the, the areas and, you know, parts of East Harlem and Harlem that we go to. And in the second year, we changed the theme of the year to care of vulnerable populations or marginalized populations. And the problem-based sessions are on caring for patients living with HIV, LGBTQ plus health, addiction medicine, and care of justice-involved patients. And we do trips to different sexual health clinics um, through the DOH, to the Ali Fournay Drop-In Center, which is a drop-in center for homeless LGBT youth here in Harlem, um, where the Institute for Family Health has a, a clinic. We do an addiction medicine talk. We go to a um, outpatient addiction, addiction and recovery program in East Harlem. For the care of justice of all patients session, we go to um, Rikers Island. Um, and this is just a schematic of sort of what that year looks like. And so as they're going through ASM and structures and the different courses, they're having their clinical visits every, just about every month. They're working on their scholarly projects, and every three or four months, they're meeting as a whole group to come together. These are might be a little bit older. This is the second year. It's pretty much the same. Um, and in third year, the students become interact students. I mean, by that point, most of the students have already worked on and presented their scholarly projects, which is great. We'll go into the sort of scholarship around primary care that students have done in a little bit. Many of them have now done more than one project, which is great. Also importantly, at the end of third year, we ask the PCSP students to do a longitudinal patient care presentation for a patient that they've worked with now for three years. Um, with the idea that, you know, as fourth year rolls around, they're applying to residencies, we really want those patients who they've developed a relationship with to be transitioned to the new class of PCSP folks who are coming in. And so first year medical students have an opportunity to work with the third years to really take on that panel so that they can care for them in their clinical sessions. And they're doing a lot of teaching during the interact uh, didactic sessions and doing a lot of sort of primary care, career mentorship. And whenever we do those coffee sessions, any of the students from all of the years are welcome to come. So sometimes they'll just drop by. Um, and this is a schematic of the third year and the fourth year. And so like I mentioned, they're working on their scholarly projects presenting. And as Re uh, Rena had mentioned, loan repayment is $20,000 a year for four, four years to total $80,000. So this is just a smattering of some of the projects that the students have taken on um, over the past four years. Many of them have done more than one. If we were to divide the projects into sort of buckets, I would say that about two thirds, um, a little bit over half of the projects are um, projects working with different organizations. So we have a couple of students working with um, Libertas at Elmhurst, um, a number of students working, or one student working with um, survivors of the World Trade Center. We have people working in um, at Rikers with a lot of help from the CMCA. That would be Eva, who's a second year. We have students working with school-based health centers, both within the Institute for Family Health and outside of the Institute for Family Health. And then we have, I would say, about a third of students doing projects in continuous quality improvements, um, both at the Institute for Family Health and also outside of it. Some people are working with uh, like the pediatric complex care coordination team, look at quality metrics around patient satisfaction and um, utilization of the program, <laughs> visiting docs as well. And so this is just one example of a project. We have students doing medical education projects too. Um, and so the mentor for this project was Rachel Rosenberg, who's one of the faculty members for the program and also an attending at the Family Health Center of Harlem. And she worked with a current fourth year student um, and they were really interested in looking at the flipped classroom model and how that could be applied to family medicine residency didactics. And so really the range of pro projects that students work on runs the gamut, which is very nice. Um, this student, like I said, did two projects. And so she also worked with Dr. Wilder, who used to work at the Department of Family Health, but she actually moved to Florida. And they published on um, the health impact of gentrification. Um, and so they had done a pretty comprehensive literature review on the topic um, and partnered with our director of community health and outreach. 
and Dr. Wilder, like I mentioned, who published, they also presented in Georgia. And so we have students presenting nationally along with their mentors. Another student presented locally at the Institute for Family Health's Research and Innovation um, Symposium. Um, and she partnered with uh, one of the psychologists at the Institute for Family Health. And they looked at a comparative review of TCA prescribing practices for, for patients who had a history of suicidal ideation in their chart. And so were clinicians paying attention to dosing, to frequency? Is TCA prescribing the best choice for a patient who has known suicidal ideation documented in their chart? And she actually won. It was her first poster presentation ever, and she won uh, in the research category at the Institute Symposium, and so she was incredibly happy. And I was like, it's all downhill from here. <laughs> but, um, and of course, I didn't really mean that, but she was incredibly excited because she, you know, she had me take her picture in front of her poster, and she was like, this is my first poster. Can you send it to my mom? And I said, yes, I don't need your mom's number, but we'll do that. <laughs> um, and then she won. And so she was incredibly excited. This student did a project with visiting doctors, like I mentioned, looking at implementation of the community paramedicine program. I love this student. The student also did another project looking at access to dialysis services for patients who are undocumented and worked with a incredible physician out in Arizona. Do you know about this? This student is like amazing to create a resource for undocumented patients who are seeking dialysis services because previously they had to go to the, through the ER to set up these services and get their services and forget about long term and you know what do you do about coverage and incredible document was, was produced um, and so if anyone's interested I'm sure she's, she'd be happy to share that and she's really proud of her work and she also presented at the American Geriatric Society's annual conference and so just this one is done with Angel and so this is our second year medical students who was doing work out in Rikers. She came to the program with extensive work in, I think she'd done work with a community-based organization that was decreasing rates of recidivism and working with people who had experiences with the criminal justice system. And so she had done some interesting work prior and really wanted to build on that interest through primary care and was lucky enough to get partnered with a mentor who could help her do that. So these are just some examples. I didn't want to spend too much time talking about them. I wanted to maybe leave a little bit of time for questions. These are our faculty members, and these are our students. I think that's it. Yes, that is it. Thank you for the opportunity to talk.